Okay, hello everybody and welcome to another uh, podcast with the Institute of Classical Osteopathy and today we have uh, Robert. Hello Robert. Hello Diego. Hello and we have Alex again. Hello Alex. Hello, hello Diego. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Thank you for coming again and and talking to, to all the followers that we have and uh, talking about osteopathy. So uh, today, uh, well Alex, you, you know Alex, but I, I was just looking to you know, on Google, of course, but it's something that is, he's an osteopath, a naturopath, lifestyle consultant, but something that really uh, is very nice. Uh, and he says, he said, Nat nature cure is much more than a way of dealing with disease. It's a, essentially a way of looking at life. And I think uh, when I talk to Alice, uh, you get the feeling he, he lives the, the way he talks. Mm -hmm. So um, that's very nice. And, and we as a, uh, Osteopaths, I think we have to be kind of an example for patients mm. as well, you know. <laughs> in, 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 <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Um, today, I, I wanted uh, the, the last post podcast, it was more about yourself and, you know, to know more a bit more about you. But today, we, we would like to talk about you know different uh, approaches to to the patient's uh, vitality the inner force that the patient has um of, co of course there are many de definitions to health uh you know the, the more you hear the more definitions that people get but you know how how would you look into the aspect of the the patient's health when they come through the door well i suppose um yeah, how do I how do I look at a patient's health? I mean, it's the overall question. So I suppose that that those, as I said, may, maybe last time, I I kind of like to just um, first of all get an appreciation of what the patient knows about me, because once once I know really wh where they're coming from, what their understanding is of of what I'm going to provide them, then I already have a better idea of what they're expecting. And then obviously, I like to kind of say to them, look, if I was a genie, and I had, uh, I could give you as many wishes as you like what would they be? And that would normally, I would say, you know, that would normally entail some form of musculoskeletal distress. They might be in some form of pain or ache or have some form of feeling in their body that they want to get rid of. But they might also have some other kind of ailments or some other um, issues that they might not necessarily associate with an osteopath. They might have um, period pain or migraines, or they might have some kind of bowel disturbance so I'll say you know within this genie kind of thing you can list as many musculoskeletal things as you like but you can list some physiological things you can list some mental or emotional or kind of lifestyle things that you know that it gives them the chance to say yes I've come in you know look I've come in with my shoulder problem and I've got my back problem but look I mean if you could help me with my eczema that would be great and um, you know I also have some IBS but I'm also going through a divorce right now you know so I'm I'm really stressed and you know or someone just died and that that already gives me a huge picture about them physically mentally emotionally spiritually what they're kind of going through so I kind of have that already that idea of where they're at um, and then comes in sort of a little bit of me just explaining a little bit more about where I'm going to be directing them from and and then from there comes that sort of like that just your gauge, you're picking up information about them all the time, aren't you? And so then it becomes a way of how to dress it. So I think that's what you were asking, like just in the sense of, you know, how do I how do I pick up, I suppose? Is that, you know, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. That, that's what I, I was asking, because uh, I, I suppose uh, health is, is something very specific to, to every patient. It's not a, a definition that you can widespread to everybody the same sort of definition so health as you were saying you know someone going through a divorce might be different at that moment of life yeah health for them yeah and and you know that those those kind of stresses already give me an idea as to how much adrenal overload they're in um you already get to pick up stuff about their emotions their posture what they want to talk about i always remember people at university at the beginning sort of saying you know people might mention something quite important once or twice and if you don't pick up on that in those early stages that might be the little box you know they they, they might really want to talk about those other issues 
Um, so those are kind of really important, I think, sometimes just to give them the awareness, first of all, that you might be able to offer them something much more than they feel you that they might have heard about. You know, and obviously my scope of what I believe is possible from an osteopathic alongside a nature cure lifestyle and, and those things. We have a way as it's not it's not it's not an alternative to medicine it's an alternative medicine it is an alternative way of looking at the way that the body is and so exactly as you said you know nature cure and all of these things have got have got a have got a name for people who have normally gone through the medical profession and come out the other side and they they're a lost cause and then they suddenly find these kind of crazy institutions especially you know a couple of hundred years ago but if we can try and if we, you know, my, my ideal is to offer people preventative medicine. It's, pre, it's health care, not disease care, you know. So I, um, I I sort of very, very much the different <laughs> to what the osteopathic college taught me at the beginning, not the ICO, but from 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 the more mainstream osteopathic college of, um, you know, find it, fix it, leave it alone. But mm. they'd interpreted that as don't open Pandora's box. Mm. So don't don't try and get to the deep issued uh, the issues that the patient might be presenting with. Just try and superficially reduce their symptoms and kind of send them on their way. Mm. And of course, that classical approach is completely the opposite. You're you're looking to offer them the availability and the option of opening Pandora's box, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and that within that um, we have a philosophy that's able to tie together so many different avenues of their health that they, you know, they it, it's not a it's obviously not a surprise when 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 they um, find that their hip is at the other end of the femur to their knee, and so mm-hmm. having a, a, a hip specialist and a knee specialist is kind of ridiculous if you've got the ends of the same bone. Well, that that's kind of quite obvious to them, but sometimes if you're dealing with let's say their pelvis for example and they're thinking about their sacroiliac joint that it doesn't immediately for them um, transfer into uterine fibroids or polyps in their digestive system or the ongoing inguinal or femoral hernia that they are about to be operated on Um, so I think that sometimes just um giving them a chance to really open themselves up to say all of these different things but also gives us the chance then to go back five ten you know sessions or years later and kind of see where they were at and then see that we can actually have a humongous effect on their their entire life one one of the one of the things about osteopathy is uh, that it's not disease centric which is what you're talking about alex it's uh, it's it's health centric no, yeah. and uh, and then there's which is what you know Andrew Taylor still first uh, talked about. You know, it's it's easy to find disease; it's more difficult to find health. We we engage with health. Right? Yeah. Right. We don't ignore disease, but we we engage with health and, and we consider disease as part of health. You yeah. know, which is uh, which is what makes osteopathy um, a, a unique uh, 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 yeah therapy or, or alternative treatment to uh to mainstream medicine and pe- people people don't understand that and we, we do we have to try and get that over to them uh, yeah. and, uh, and also a bit. you know treatment we, we think of treatment as you know as you said go, going to see someone when you're in a lot of pain mm. and you know i'm i'm, I'm happy to do de- i'm happy to deal with people's pain but it's much more pleasurable to treat people when they're out of pain mm. a they have a lot more a scope in order to absorb the information that you're giving them mm. they have a lot more ability and energy and vitality and able to integrate the the movements and the and the the effect that you're giving to their body mm. it can be much more pleasurable you can have longer treatments mm. <laughs> you can you can mm, you, your vitality is raised your ability to go further is raised and my, i always say to patients you know treatment really starts when you're out of pain you know, treating someone in a lot of pain is a, is a stressful thing. It's a stressful thing for us as osteopaths. Mm. You know, we don't like putting them through pain. We're trying to alleviate that, but there's only a certain amount you can do. Very often, when they're in pain, they're very mm. tired. They're in acute. So, as we were talking about earlier, you know that you know treatment has to be a lot shorter. So, almost I say to them, like you know, you know, effect of for your money or time for your money, you get more if you come in when you're not in pain. You get mm. more, you get, and then you're going coming in maybe saying, "Yeah, I feel in a really great, great situation," and then you leave feeling even better. Mm. Then you're really into the rather than trying to just 
hold up the wobbly house with scaffolding you're really really into regrouting and putting mm. new floorboards in and deciding to sort of change the kitchen and, and you're getting on top of that run down house that we might have taken once upon a time when they're yeah. in an acute or you know or that the, the, they're in these chronic stages yeah. underpinning really those taking, foundations you're back. yeah you're laying those foundations so mm. i think you're absolutely right like treatment is a can be really pleasant and then you know it's it's, it's an anathema to think oh i'll just go i'll go for a nice massage when i feel good Mm. But when I feel bad, I'll just go to the person who can make you feel pain. You know, you can still mm. have a really enjoyable, you know, sleepy, dopey treatment that makes you feel much more energized mm. and much looser and more connected to your body mm. on many different ways. And you know, that comes out, you know, mm. when you're when you're feeling better. Mm. Yeah, to totally agree. I mean, the the the, the more I, I, I we have on the one hand to teach patients to to come to the osteopath when the the body is asking you know i always say you know there are different times during the year that you might need to come more often yep. and you know you just need to listen to your body your body is yours you you listen to to it yep. and then obviously to teach them to to look after themselves and and come when they they are not in acute pain mm. but um going a, a bit you know on, on today's uh, topic I, I wanted to ask you know about these patients that they come um with an acute onset or it can be you know sometimes you, you find on a musculoskeletal acute onset of a tendinitis or throwing headache or they had a even a, a hernia a, a sciatic pain mm -hmm. um obviously those patients they they come as you were saying with a different vitality pain they are worried moody there are different aspects to, to those patients and you know how how difficult it is for the osteopath as well to to deal with uh, the patient on the table you have to to listen the tissues how how do you deal with with these patients and, and make the best of those treatments because they are difficult treatments yeah, yeah. um Comfort, comfort number one, I reckon. I try and make the patient as comfortable as possible. Um, it's warm. Uh, I don't like a cold treatment room. <laughs> I like uh, I liked having a nice um, um, oil heater nearby so that I can warm some towels. I have a lot of patients who will say, oh, I could just come for just for the towels. <laughs> nice kind of application it already gives you the availability to use that heat or warmth as sort of gentle hydrotherapy but trying to relax their adrenal tone trying to calm them down um, in calming them down you start to alter their breath through their breath and through their heart rate and calming them down you start to reduce that adre re reduce that adrenal load so first of all if they're in a lot of physical pain just physically making them as comfortable as possible holding them supporting them with lots of pillows so if they're on their back maybe a pillow underneath their knees maybe a nice warm towel that they might be able to lie on um just first of all trying to get them to that place um i would think that probably you know acute or not i would probably have 60 or 70 percent of my patients fall asleep at some point during the treatment mm. so i want their body to almost physiologically disappear from their brain they can't feel where it's at. Um, so under the guise of, let's say, the, you know, the classical routine, for example, just using those different methods where their body is just put in so much, so much position of ease or release that they're able to really drop. They're really able to drop and pass out. And there's a really wonderful fine line in palpation and holding them, which I'm sure you're aware of. Just when you, and you might go from not stimulating treatment, but more musculoskeletal moving treatment, more through to what other people would consider to be maybe a functional cranial holding, fascially unwinding kind of position. Um, but a lot of those patients will find that as you move around from limb to limb from position, that those areas of their body almost disappear. That's what I, that's what I like to imagine for the treatment. Um, and that there are moments of, and, you know, I suppose this comes from my own hands, you know, this can't take you, but there's, there's times where you feel that you need to rock or move or, or push or pull or, or sort of coax something out. And then there's other times where you need to really become part of that tissue tone with people within your hands. So you're, you're really trying to pick up what that, 
where the draw is, where the fascial pull is, what that kind of what kind of um, words or emotions or textures or those things come to mind when you're palpating. Um, I think really, like you said, just working out where the person is on their energy level, that vital that you know we, we talked about, you know, we mentioned vitality or breath of life or force, whatever that electricity is that departs when you when you pass away <laughs> and mm-hmm. i don't know but any listener who's been in the presence of of a of a of a dead body this level of vitality on this energy or um breath of life vital vital force this electricity that departs when when you're not there now um you know, especially in nature cure and, and, and all the way through, we, we talk about sort of a, we're given a battery, a certain type of battery life. It's probably it's the only, it's the easiest analogy, isn't it, really? I mean, you know, it's not complicated, mm-hmm. but it's just quite simple in the sense that the, the battery we're given uh, when we're born is very specific to ourself. Mm. Um, you know, and so some people are born with great big double Duracell pack double plus battery lives with a couple extra kind of strapped to them and other people unfortunately are given some pretty pretty dud batteries when they're when they're first given so they they don't have a huge amount of scope Mm -hmm. but that battery life goes up and down um up and down as well as progressively down through life so obviously as we go it's right running a battery but I, i like to think that the body is a little bit like an electric car when you're kind of running it and you take your foot off the gas. Um, it uses the momentum to sort of partly charge the, the, the other electric battery. <laughs> I'm not very good with electrics, but that's my understanding anyway. And, 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 and so rest and sleep um, is incredibly important in the nature cure lifestyle, um, especially in both people who are in acute forms of distress or disease and even more so in those people who are in a chronic state um, because um, the energy of our the, the energy that we have in our body um, is needed for obviously repair and building and it's needed for digestion and the two of those factors both digesting the food and repairing our body will take up the majority of every day's daily activity mm. the rest of the the rest of the pie chart of energy for so to speak we get to do what we want with it <laughs> but at the end of each day if we if we don't sleep or we don't rest you know we've only got two or three days before we are malfunctioning on a serious physiological level you know it's it's not you won't know many people that will just say oh i'm going to take a week where i don't sleep this week i'm just going to do you know four four days straight it's yeah. just it's not possible their body will will start breaking down and so um physiologically that battery starts to go right down into the red but then when we do rest and um, we rest and sleep we have times where our vital force will go back up again Mm. but Mm. over a period of time we're dropping that vital force aren't we as we go through life which is why we have so much more vitality and vibrancy as a baby and it's Mm. very often why we see so much of the body's innate healing mechanism wanting to express itself Mm. um and so we're kind of then back to maybe i don't know talking about maybe the energy the energy energetics between somebody who's in an acute phase and somebody who's in a chronic phase mm. well i suppose what is an acute phase an acute phase in the the, the title itself suggests um an, an increased inflammatory or eliminative effort by the body mm. Both of which, inflammation and irritation, are all parts of healing. You know, I remember, what are the signs of healing? Redness, swelling, pain, pressure. Um, All of these things are where there's an increased blood supply carrying nutrient-rich blood to a tissue. And then there is some form of engorgement in the local tissue, which causes um, the venous and lymphatic kind of backup. But all of these things are showing an acute effort by the body to heal and if it's a constitutional Mm. approach as in if the body needs to do general cleaning within the body or general detoxifying if it's not an acute i've broken my leg or i've slipped over and sort of torn a muscle or those kind of things if it's more of an acute illness for example um 
we think of that again as a negative thing. But again, from the osteopathic and the nature cure world, we see a, an acute onset of an inflammatory or, or healing as being a process that the body has chosen to do. Yeah, um, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's not the body going wrong, is it? You know, it's, it's this cytokine uh, release and this organisation via the brainstem of sickness behaviour, which is yes. giving us instructions what we should be doing. Sleeping, exactly. not eating, not having sex and not running around and, and doing yeah. stuff, which is why, you know, if, if you have a dog and it doesn't turn up for meal time, you know, it's uh, and it's upstairs asleep under your bed or something like that, you know, there's something wrong. It's in sickness behavior, which is your body's instructions telling you what you should be doing. But we're so good at ignoring that. We, I, I've got I've got to go to work today. I'll take some tablets and that'll shut it all down. You know, that's exactly the process. And so that's, you know, that's a re that's a really important point you've, you're bringing up there, Robert, which is, you know, I, I guide patients right the way from day one about um, you know, I might not talk about the acute crisis, but it's very, very early in their behavior and their knowledge and their understanding, especially if they're coming in with a with a chronic uh, constitutional problem that I'm going to be aiming to push them towards illness. <laughs> <laughs> You know that that it's through it's through them being unwell that we will get the biggest jumps in their health. Yeah. yeah. Which at the beginning to the lay person, they just think, well, what are you talking about? You know, illness is when I go to the doctor. I don't mm. like it. Mm. But I will then turn it around and say, well, tell me one form of illness or one form of symptom that is a bad sign in your body. Mm. And actually, we find that you know those who are in a chronic state of disease, those people who are maybe stage four or later stages of cancer or lymphoma or really um, irritant inflammatory disorders that they don't really ever have coughs and colds. They, their, their acute phases have kind of gone. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they will very often in their, in their case history talk about maybe their early onset eczema and then that developed into their asthma and then the asthma went away in their teenage years and then they got colitis and oh but then they went to university and then they got me or chronic fatigue syndrome or some kind of long un, un misunderstood condition mm -hmm. when they were already hugely toxic hugely tired going off to university and like not drink not not, not sleeping and drinking and eating all the wrong mm -hmm. things um, and then subsequently, later to that, after the ME stages, then in their early in their twenties, they might start showing up with some kind of autoimmune condition or some form of more chronic situation. Mm -hmm. And maybe at that point, they might also say, "Well, you know, I don't really get much colds, or I don't really I haven't got a fever anymore, and and I don't really sweat." You know, you talk about them kind of going to the gym or whether the exercise and whether they can get a sweat going. Well, they say, "Well, I, you know, I, I do actually try and do some exercise, but I I very rarely sweat." Mm -hmm. You know, and so you realize that there are all these areas of their body that are physically and physiologically closing down. They, they just have windows that are that are sort of rusted shut in their house and they don't even they're not even aware of some of these portals. Um, so I don't know how, how you gauge that. I mean, everything from their look in their eyes, their temperature, the way that, you know, how, how much they want to. I would say how much they want to talk, but I talk a lot, don't I? <laughs> yeah, some people talk more than others, don't they? You know? but, um, yeah, but, you know, I, I often like, I like seeing patients or sometimes patients where they seem really, really quite wired and they're talking a lot and then then you lie them down and and I, and I have a pretty much a rule. I don't, I don't, I don't talk in treatment or I do if I'm just directing them to just really feeling what I'm trying to do for them or just I just say I'm constantly saying you know you don't need to respond but just pick up this what I'm about to tell you about your body but I don't need them kind of talking to me and I don't want any hairdressing osteopathy or what you're doing this weekend or how are you doing this I really want them to just fall into their body not talk to relax their tongue relax their jaw to relax their eyes to look completely comatosed on the plinth and and for them to know that I won't jump on them and I won't do something sudden and there won't be any sudden clicks or there won't be anything painful. This is going to be the most luxurious, nice, pleasant treatment that they can do. And their only role is to try and play dead, to to to, to give them to give me their body. And when I say to them, oh, relax or let this go for them not to worry, but then for just to understand that that's their nervous brain holding onto an area of their lip, that their, their, their body that I I just want to let go. 
But I, I find it very interesting as to sometimes very often it's the people who are really overstimulated, quite adrenal, maybe have a thyroid issue, maybe kind of have got a bit of redistribution of body fat on their face and their back. And you're thinking what's going on with their adrenal glands and what's happening with their body. And they lie themselves down and maybe within a couple of couple of couple of minutes of treatment, they're asleep, like really fast, deep asleep. Um, and um, I've actually seen it. I've seen it a lot in my parents' world because obviously my parents were mm. really famous ballet dancers. Mm. So I've seen a lot of actors and a lot of um, on stage people who are very good at putting on a mm. face <laughs> that everything's Showtime. fine. Showtime. Yeah, yeah. Um, my mum used to call it something in teeth, <laughs> but it was very much like. <laughs> Yeah, a woman's well, part and teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Just o- over the top, like I'm fine and this and that. And then maybe you just give a little bit of support and relaxation and yeah. oh, the tears start flowing or the yeah. emotion starts coming out. Or they say, you know, when they do start coming down and all these, you know, negative thoughts or negative things start happening in their body or you start to relax them and boom, they're out. Mm. Cold, like so deep asleep. Mm. And that very often comes from that physiological changes i find mm. especially through the the sort of viscerosomatic somatovisceral reflexes mm. Mm. as you're kind of holding areas of their body sometimes you're finding that when you're moving them around musculoskeletally as in mechanically moving them something might be held or quite tight mm. but it's not a mechanical restriction mm. then maybe you, you hold onto that limb and you just feel it and let it relax and ease as you said fascially or sort of that you know, these terms of just trying to make it a little bit more comfortable make it disappear and and you feel these little tissue releases and at the same time you feel these gurgles grumbles you know if you're holding the right arm you might feel that release coming through the right side of the diaphragm or within the liver as the phrenic nerve maybe affects itself and there's these drops and then through these, you know, how often the patient, oh, sorry, I, I think I'm hungry or, or I've eaten something mm. or I've done You know, they only say that on the first or the second treatment. Mm. And then they're just aware of how much when you pick up certain areas of the body, you can almost direct them to where that gurgling is going to mm. happen. And they really understand that presence. And then I really like that feeling that comes with whether you're whether it's more reducing the sympathetic tone or allowing the expression of the parasympathetic, uh, allowing safety and allowing the digestion to kick off and allowing mm. that energy flow, that blood flow to enter into the splanchnics and e- enter into the visceral system, the visceral organs let go. Very often that gives them that dopey, sleepy, mm. oh, but they're already laid down and that calmness and woof, that lets them really go. Mm. And then you're able to play, aren't you? Play in between conscious and unconscious. You really get the feeling of, oh, really how the tissues are without any being any any of this sort of social and environmental construct that we put on us, what people are thinking. In fact, I, I had a therapist locally recently, uh, or a patient, uh, someone I'm doing swaps with in Stroud, and he's been bringing his daughter to see me. And she only came for the second treatment and he dropped her off. Uh, she's 16. And I said, if uh, he came to pick her up, I said, he said, how did it go? And I said, well, I, I always feel that if you can get a 16 year old girl to fall asleep at about three thirty, four o'clock in the afternoon, when they're not tired in the presence of, a, of another guy in a room, it just really shows safety. It really mm-hmm. shows just relaxing on their body on a deep mm-hmm. level. You know, it's just that I love it when kids come in after school and they're all like really jumped up and a little bit of treatment. And these, you know, seven to 12 year old kids will just pass out like mm. so deep that their parents can hardly wake them up, wake them up or get them off the blimp. <laughs> I mean, it's the middle of the day, you know, and sometimes they've even had sugar just before they came in. Mm. And I think that's, that is really, and then that to me is a sign of how, you know, A, how connected they are to their body, mm. how responsive they are, but it also gives me this gauge of how tired they are. You know, mm. how much are they stimulated in their outside world? How how many how many people will sit down and they never watch a film because they, they, they turn the TV on and they fall asleep straight mm. away? Like just so underneath that super superficial, I've just woken up and my vital force has raised ever so slightly and I'm ready to go again. How long can they... How, how long can that carry on? So I, I think that that's an interesting sort of marker, at least, for seeing where the people are at. 
Mm. And and then it sort of transfers, doesn't it, into like as we said, how to take somebody from a chronic situation more towards an acute situation. Mm. How do we? How do well, we? I was just uh, before we carry on. I yeah. want to to um, highlight to the to the audience that I mean. It, it, Everything you have said is is such a it has got such a deep understanding of the body and the experience of of an osteopath who an osteopath is someone who has been uh, in contact with the skin of a patient for I don't know twenty years yeah seeing patients ten patients ten people every day palpating the skin the reaction looking into those changes in in the in the person i mean it's it's amazing that the amount of information that you just gave like like that mm -hmm. and uh, i would like people to understand you know every you know since you were talking about this acute patient that comes to the clinic and and you make them comfortable or these patients that you say the um, the the gut start to you know to move around you're talking about not Techniques we haven't mentioned no one technique. We are talking about sympathetics, parasympathetics, reaction of the patient, make them comfortable. Which is is osteopathy is simple, but at the same time it's complicated. How you manage those patients? What technique are you going to do? What a functional technique, a, a spiritualism? Yeah. I don't know. It's it's just yeah. uh, in my opinion. Yeah. You mentioned something really important, which is rocking, which is oscillation, which is the that inner movement that we all have in our, in our body. As you were saying, the life force, when someone is dead, is dead. There yeah. is no oscillation in that body. Yes. So that's the, 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 the main technique, I would say. And then working with the nervous system. I mean, sorry, Alex, I, it's just, no, I, I want no, to it's... emphasize that because yeah. I think it's so important. Because the thing is, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly trying to find trying to find ways of, of describing to people what I feel. And, and you know, and this is, I, look, it's, it's not to try, I don't want to put myself on a pedestal. I can only say what I say, but like, you know, there's the intellectualization mm. of reductionist mechanical movement you mm. can teach that to anybody but it doesn't mean that their hands feel right <laughs> mm. yeah you can you can you can teach someone the art of or maybe throwing clay on a pot on a on a wheel and trying to create a vase mm. but someone some people will just have a have a way of molding and blending and Whoa, that just is just easy. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the, so the, I, the, I the art in the science, isn't it? The art in the science, yeah. yeah. So, so, the, the, so all of these nuances where we we're trying to, I, I try and push towards a, 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 a practitioners or, or students to kind of think, you know, what what is this texture? What what does it what does it feel underneath you? Mm -hmm. Is this is this hard, cold, frozen butter, mm -hmm. or is it margarine in a pot? <laughs> is it is it is it hard in the middle defrosted but it's soft on the outside could okay. you hold something that's hot on the uh, cold on the outside and can you try and imagine heating the inside <laughs> <laughs> transmitting vibrate vibratory force without kind of actually doing anything to it it's all quite it's all quite interesting and so i think you you saying about the, the vibration or oscillation? Oscillation. I mean, I I remember it was like you know Arnold Lederman and harmonic technique back in the sort of nineties or two thousand mm. whatever, of 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 pushing of pushing something and rhythmically feeling how it comes back, mm. and um, within that you're already on a frequency, aren't you? You're playing like a a guitar. You're playing a dong. You're you're pushing something and you're feeling the rebound. Within that rebound, because uh, underneath our hands we can flay skin off, you can go skin, superficial fat, you know, um, outside of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a muscle sheath, inside of a muscle sheath, underneath, in through the ligament, in through the capsule, into the bone, in the bone itself. You can hold the limb and push through the limb and bend the bone itself. So you have you have this depth of layerage layer layers all the way through so you know I, I like to say to patients it's like if we, if i put my hand on the top and the bottom of a pa of a patient's body it's as if i'm trying to imagine in my hand as if i held a football 
have I got a, if they're elastic bands from every different angle of the football yeah. <laughs> to the other side? That's quite wonderful, Alex. And you know, one of the things that is really wonderful about that is 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 learning to trust what we feel. It's it's yeah. understanding the layers of what we of what we feel and and trusting that rather than someone saying, "Oh, but in in research it says." It says you shouldn't trust what you're feeling. We have to trust what we you, feel. You've got no, you've got no other choice. The thing is, mm. you just do it in every, in every other, every other, every other element of life. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. you've got to trust yourself all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes there are rules, and then yeah. you say, "I've got to trust what I'm feeling." Yeah. It feels like it's going to rain. Mm. Feels like my kids are going to be yeah. ill. It yeah. feels like yeah. I'm going to something's going to happen. You have yeah. to trust in that. Yeah. And so within this, it's like it's it's it's. Um, I kind of imagine like like having a, having a bunch of students and ten students holding round, holding like an an Egyptian cotton sheet, mm. and you've all got them all blindfolded. And you're going to make a hole at some point in the middle of the sheet somewhere, and everyone's got to work together to try and work out where the rip is in the sheet. You know mm. who who pulls at what angles that could create a pulling and a, oh that's that that and and so you start to create a three dimensional helical shape in the body of, of what you imagine is going to be there. And when you put your hands on, you start to have these pullings, set sensations of pulling in and puckeredness and, and, mm. and tissues that are harder and, and, and they have less vibrancy and less give and less mm. pull and, and you, you're tractioning it, but you can feel that it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, 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 a fresh bouncy mm. elastic band, you know, how many Christmas games you could, couldn't you? You could blindfold people. They give games that you put your hands into and you hold on to things, and they're just thinking, "What is this thing in the game at Christmas?" Everyone's going to be putting it up, but you could do it with elastic bands. You could do like, "What's the quality?" Let's have 10, 100, 100 grades of elastic band. Mm. You know, bouncy, small, thin, thick, brittle. Some mm. that are about to crack. You know, mm. and some people they'll pick it up and they'll already know. Oh, this is this is oh a bit frayed and a bit plasticky and it's mm. dry and i can feel that it's gonna it's gonna ping oh yeah that's exactly where mm. it's gonna be you can feel these moments mm. in the same way i say to a patient you know if you imagine a green stick a bendy stick mm. that you pick up in the park and you can think i can bend this whole thing around and it ah, oh, it's, it's mm. going but another one you pick it up and you know that i'm gonna break it it's just yeah. there it's just there and you can feel that moment mm. before and, and that is part of Part of detecting health, isn't it? Detecting the health exactly. of the tissues. Yes. And so sometimes that vibrancy is too low. Mm. And so sometimes you need to listen to Diego, like with that oscillation you were saying, sometimes mm. you need to kind of shake shake the limb up a little bit. Mm. And sometimes mm. you need to slow it back down. Exactly. Sometimes you need to hold on to it, to give it safety, to, to subdue it with tactileness, that is giving comfort and confidence. It's like holding a baby, you know, mm. holding a baby. You can hold them what lightly in one hand, holding them, and they can feel completely secure. Um, or you can you can hold them really erratically with mm. a load of fear, and, and they can be really scared about the way that you feel holding them. You know, that's why I've got all these videos, haven't we? I've got I've got my you know my girls like balancing on my hand at eleven weeks old because. <laughs> I you we can we're very good at feeling the structure and feeling the balance and feeling these tissues, but then they can also feel that within us, and so it's a bit of a play, play yeah. with it. Also, the, the the temperature, you know, when you realize that something is really cold, an area yeah. of the body or, or very hot, you know. Yes. Sweaty. So yeah. that's another element you put into those. Tissues. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. and and that and and that temperature is is one of the best ones because. The most important part of any healing anywhere is heat, mm -hmm. isn't it? Really, think, yeah. you know, heat melts viscosity. It ups the it ups the metabolic rate. Mm. So, on a constitutional problem, we, we, you can't have an acute eliminative effort without a fever. Mm. It's just it's not possible, and that's why you know we're we're looking to support that fever in a patient. We're not looking to suppress it. So uh, the number is irrelevant to me. What what the number is mm. um, on the thermometer is completely irrelevant to the the behaviour of the person in front of them. Mm. And in fact, actually, make, making parents put thermometers away is is something very important, mm. um, especially when the kid is you know when Joey's running round or with his top off and they want they want to try and pull him in from the garden. You know, mm. the fact that he has a fever is irrelevant. You mm. know. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, or, or the, uh, the the child with uh, that huge stream of green snot out of his out of both <laughs> nostrils, but happy running around doing stuff, and they're terribly Absolutely. concerned about this 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 uh, snot coming out of his nose. But the child doesn't care; he's having a great time. And quite often, by the time that the snot has come out, mm. it's already gone through that acute yeah. phase where yeah. you, you, in the production of the snot, in the mm. liberation of the snot yeah. deep within the cellular yeah. membranes and the mucous membranes beforehand, mm. the, 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 the fever is preceding it. Mm. Hence the whole, you know, germs and bacteria. There's a mm. lot of time in those early acute phases that you swab eh, eh, the tissues, whatever tissues mm. you're dealing with, and there's very nondescript forms of bacterium or pathogens mm. that are around. Mm. Later on, per se, especially when the fevers drop, that's when the elimination comes. Mm. You know, first comes the fever, the shivering, the achiness, the complete lethargy in bed. Mm. It's two or three days later when you're walking around and find that you're bringing up all of your snot or the mm. or the sputum, and the actual eliminating the the gunk has been produced mm. by the body, and then it starts to come out of one of those organs of elimination. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, um, Alex, and and uh, sorry. Um, I just want wanted to go back. I, I interrupt interrupted you when you were going to talk about. You know, you you said those patients that um, they uh, you know eliminated. They cut those acute onsets that they get spots, uh, diarrhea, vomiting. You know, we we know you know through the childhood towards the the adulthood, people just ignore those signs and then they become chronic how, how different is an acute uh, to 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 this cram and they haven't developed any fever or any diarrhea or any elimination process or sweating that you you mentioned yes. very important yeah. as well very important so they're all they're, they're all they're, they're all like new apps we need to upload on their on their body and we need to give them the opportunity to relearn again um, in order to do that, um, we kind of go back to the vital force, which is they need to alkalinize their system um, in order to allow their body to start to liberate the acid toxic load that's inside of them. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time as generally overhauling their life with an alkaline view, um, it is to go through. <clears throat> A form of conservation of energy. Um, so um, I explain to patients the term sort of stimulation and innovation. And so innovation is the use of nerve power um, in in order to eliminate toxins from the body. And when they get innovated, they start to lose out their 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 their, their body power. Their, their <laughs> the wattage in their in in the electrics running through their walls starts to drop and so when their when their when their energy is lowered in the day it reaches a point where their body just doesn't have enough to start elimination so elimination is checked hmm. um so that's why when one of those fundamental three things when we go into an acute condition we go through total conservation of energy so that is the lethargy that the body has which is just saying i want to crawl into bed and i don't want to move I, my body is aching and i do not want to move but it also conserves not through just through movement but from physiological activity so that's when the fast kicks in and so the fast thing is then the body saying i don't want to spend 50 percent of that daily energy that i've got on digesting the food and mm. i don't want to spend another 30 percent of it running around you're running around doing useless things mm. so we have lethargy and we have a loss of appetite mm. and then the third thing is all you need which is a fever <laughs> mm. Mm. so um, the fever then ups the metabolic rate which causes the body to start to break down the local pathogens. And then the increase in heat allows the breaking up of solid material into liquid material. And it allows our body to start going through that acute eliminative effort. So then we use our skin, our lungs, our, cut, our guts, I'm sorry, our kidneys, our liver, or our uterus for the elimination. Yeah. But in those in those later stages, as you said, Diego, we, we've got people who are in a chronic state and they, 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 they don't they don't have the availability. They don't normally have that. So 
then what we're trying to do, as we said, is is conserve the energy that they've got and be wary of the fact that, especially through the classical osteopathic approach, I feel that we have to be very, very, de- very, very careful, especially as to the amount of power we each wield within the with the ability to do things to the body that the body might not be ready for. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the ego really has to step out the way and to start to take in the effect of how big, how small, how tired, how exhausted, how toxic, how is this patient looking in front of me? Because I can go in there with a wrecking ball and I can start knocking down walls and I can start ripping up floorboards. But if this house is unstru- is is unsafe, then it's very, very easy to send them into a... Um, treatment crisis rather than a healing crisis mm, yeah. um, and, and that is what i find I, I think is very very important that's that's um, key yeah that's because important. the difference between these three is as i try and i tr- try to label them over a long period of time but that first one i don't know whether we spoke about this last time but 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 what i call a toxic crisis is somebody who's woken up after you know the night before when they think oh if I go out tonight and I go drinking or I go and have a curry or I go to the works party I really don't want to do I don't feel very well tomorrow I think I'm I'm going to be ill but they do it anyway and they go to the party and they drink the drinks and they eat the wrong foods and all that kind of stuff and yes per se they wake up the following morning with a streaming nose or a hangover but they also feel really achy and now now they're definitely starting to feel a bit acute well, that's what I would consider to be a toxic crisis. The body is just is using the organs of elimination and using the fever that you're presenting with to try and survive. It's just trying to get rid of the surplus overload of toxicity within the system. This is like the superficial level, isn't it? It's just the yeah. On the on superficial of, level, it's just I'm I'm yeah, tired. I'm yeah. stressed. I've been eating mm. the wrong things. Mm. I just my body is toxic. And I know that I need to take care of myself better, but I'm, I'm, mm. I'm about to feel ill. Mm. And the body says, well, look, if I hold on to this stuff even longer, then I'm going to go into a chronic state of mm. illness. I'm going to be chronically storing all this mm. rubbish. So if I acutely get rid of this, I'll be in a much better state. So a hangover, for example, <laughs> is not a healing crisis. It's not a healing crisis, as I would like to put it. It's not jumping you to a whole new level of health. It's just repairing you <laughs> from yeah, yeah. From yeah. from the from the over overindulgence the night before, mm. so that's a that's a treat that that that's a toxic crisis, mm. and then there's a treatment crisis like that per, that same person for example that I've just mentioned, just before they're being ill, they might say, oh, I'm going to go and see Diego. I'm going to go and have some nice treatment. He said to come in when I'm not in pain. Well, I'm definitely run down and I definitely don't feel very good at the moment, but I, but I'll go along. And then we get really over the top involved where we like, oh, we want this patient to feel better and we want them to sleep better. And, oh, this treatment is going really well. And they're, they're, their body's responding. In fact, they're physiologically just begging, the, the body's begging for some treatment. But we give too much mm. or we treat their body and we open all of these vessels up and we provide nutrient rich blood and we open up all of this venous and lymphatic flow. We open up all of these these energetic expressions of nerve energy. But of course, what we've effectively done is maybe gone and rod the sewer and let this huge avalanche of water come in. Mm. But none of the rice fields are ready for it. And so mm. it just destroys the rice fields rather than having some form of irrigation. We haven't mm. prepared the body. We haven't l- reduced the toxic load. We haven't told them to eat healthier. We haven't taken this. We've just said, oh, you know, the rule of the artery is supreme. Well, that's what Andrew Taylor still said. So I'll just, I'm just going to make sure there's a fresh blood supply. But I'm like, well, what if the blood supply is just filled with horrible, mm. poisonous, toxic matter? I mean, you're just supplying, you're just, you're just pumping all of this stuff around the body. Mm. And that's exactly what can happen. So we, we lower the adrenal tone, we improve all of the plumbing, but the patient is in a chronic state, is, is, in a, is an awful state anyway. And so we, through reducing the adrenal load, allow the tissues to dump a whole load of extra toxins into the bloodstream. But of course, it can't cope and the skin hasn't been opened up and the the body hasn't prepared itself in any way. And so the patient has a really lovely reaction, but they phone you up the following day and they say, I don't know what happened. I've got a very bad cold today Mm. or I'm stuck on the loo or, you know, I've got a really bad headache. In fact, my migraines kicked off. 
Mm. And very often we have to realize that that is a treatment crisis. We have we have triggered a crisis in a patient through our own powerful mechanical influence on that person's body. But it is not a healing crisis come yeah. from within the person's body because otherwise they would be phoning us up. Mm. And then that is that is the that is the the route to number door number three acute mm -hmm. crisis number three well acute crisis number three is a really true healing crisis mm -hmm. and that is where sorry that is where somebody has made changes in improving their environment on the external the exogenous and the endogenous toxins that the body is producing from outside and from within inside mm -hmm. and they're reducing that toxic load by breathing fresher air by taking some sunlight in by having more rest and sleep to up their vital force by reducing the load of you know alcohol and refined foods mm. and sugars and processed foods and candies and chocolates and alcohol and coffee and so all these kind of other things and they've up their alkaline intent and they've started walking and moving swimming lightly rather than overpowering themselves with lactic acid anaerobic respiration and they've made all these things so that they're having more alkalinity in their body and they're reducing the acid load and they're also conserving their own energy whilst dealing with maybe their alcoholism or their you know relationship issue or their financial difficulties or you know they, they might be seeking something else on a mental and emotional or environment or a community level that they require also and then they start to increase in their vitality and they lose a little bit of weight and they feel a little bit stronger and maybe they're sleeping a little bit erratically, but they're sweating in the nighttime. But, they're, but then they're getting some occasional good night sleeps and then and you see them and this tissue quality is changing whilst you're treating them mm -hmm. and it's improving. And then just like Mr. Wernham used to describe about the crashes, then comes the time when one day they just say, you know, <laughs> I don't feel so good tonight. I want to fall into bed. I feel a bit feverish. I don't really feel like I, I feel off. Like water tastes funny to me, <laughs> you know, and there's a little bit of swelling in my knee and my gouty toe feels a bit ugh, weird. And But I just feel I just feel like I don't feel very well. Mm. And they crawl into bed and they they and but that is a healing crisis that's come with inside of their body their body's been cleaning their body's been organizing their house their body's been creating space and taking things to the dump and taking things to the charity shop and they're getting everything ready and they're priming the walls and then one day they're ready and the kids have gone to school for a couple of days and they've got a day and they decide i'm going to just open that cupboard and i'm going to paint this wall I'm going to make some house improvements I've really been wanting to do for a while. And because they've made that those changes, the instigation of that acute crisis, that sore throat, those things comes from within the patient. It's very different. And when that happens, it's so much easier to manage. It's so much easier to support them. There's far less chance of there being a secondary, you know, superimposed mm. reaction that we didn't see. And very often you'll be able to speak to them. And what does it feel that you want to do? I feel tired. I want to crawl into bed. Okay. And what else do you want to do? I don't want to eat anything. I feel horrible. Okay. What else do you want to do? Well, I, I'm really dehydrated at the moment. I'm drinking and I'm really thirsty all the time. Okay. And is there anything else you want to do? Oh, I'm just so tired. I don't want to talk to anybody. Well, then turn off the phone and go back to bed and take a glass of water and don't worry about not doing anything and allow your fever to run and call me when you wake up, for mm. example. Those acute episodes are much shorter. They're much more manageable. And I really, it took me many, many, many years of looking at the intricate differences between natural hygiene, nature cure, classical osteopathy, and what we were trying, what we are trying to do with our patient, and when the patient has the reaction from within inside of them, and it's a very interesting concept because it's the because we can see that two hundred years ago, in 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 Europe where there were all these nature cure institutions, they used lots of ways of pushing the patient towards an acute crisis. Mm -hmm. They wanted the patient to get an acute crisis, so they dunked them in the cold water, they put them in the sunlight, they gave them massages, they gave them mechanical treatment, they gave them osteopathic treatment, they dumped them back in the cold water again, they flooded them with alkaline foods, and they dumped them back in the 
water again and then they took them for another massage and then they gave them the exercises outside and they physically pushed them really fast into these acute crises mm. but then they and, took these and some enemas yeah and some enemas <laughs> and, they, and they basically and they just you know they they pushed the patient into they they, they wrung them out they got a sponge and they just they got the patient a sponge and they, <laughs> they wrung them like that mm. And, you know, and you you have all these priestess books where they talk about, you know, the patient's ears are bursting and there's, you know, mm. there's not coming out of their eyes and they're developing cholera. And just, yeah, you yeah. know, the whole kind of shebang is up in the air. But they manage it because they could do, because legally wise, a lot of these people had just submitted themselves to this treatment mm. and they'd gone mm. to these health sanitariums mm. and they were probably rabid and they're full of diabetes and cardiovascular mm. diseases, 1800s, and they either had that or bloodletting. And so they let them do that. Mm. And of course, we can't do that now. We'd be mm. sued through our eyeballs. Mm. <laughs> so mm. the only way you can really do it nature is, is not to really do the nature cure version, but more mm. of the natural hygiene version. And the natural hygiene version with Herbert Shelton and everybody else who came from that were very much more of a let alone therapies. They were much mm. more about lifestylists, about saying to the patient, I that, that everything resolves around you. You have the power to do everything, but you have to do it because any external influence is messing with the internal healing mechanism and starting cogs turning and m momentum starting where we we just, you know, we're talking about this as if we know it, but there's so much that we don't know in the patients. Mm. We we have to we have to alleviate that because there are so many interconnecting variable factors. Mm. But we have to rely on nature for that and our understanding and our trust in nature. Bingo. That, don't we? And, Bingo. Uh, and, and just going back to the nature cure thing, you know, the forcing the crisis, that's not going to be <laughs> a great way of getting the sailors cleaning the cellular space, is it? No, it's not. And so that's why there is, a, you know, really interesting topics in the natural hygiene world, because they are very much against osteopaths and very much against hydrotherapists and very much against chiropractors because of this egotistical, I'm going to walk in, I'm going to wade in, I'm just going to just change this from good tissue to bad tissue. And they know that you can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mr. Yeah. Wernham was very, very strong about that. You can't yeah. turn the, you know, the, 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 the toxic to the untoxic. That yeah. is the patient. And you can't, you can't change those things, but you yeah. can alleviate blockages. You yeah. can improve blood flows and you yeah. can improve drainages, but we have to see that in the context of the yeah. bigger picture. Yeah. Um, because if you don't do that, you just, you, you know, you'll, and everybody has them. I've had mm. them. We've all had them where you treat someone, you treat them too much. There's a yeah. bit of an acute crisis the following day. But mm. then it's really important that you don't panic. Mm. <laughs> you don't leave the person stranded. Mm. Oh, I don't know what's going on. I'm really sorry. You probably better phone your doctor. Mm. Because you have opened Pandora's box. Mm. Um, and so then we sometimes have to like let them know that it's okay if they have mm. to shut the box, but it's okay. We might we might have opened it up a little bit too far mm. that time, mm. and and that's that judgment call that we 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 have to do. Mm. Um, but it does mean that you can give a lot of people great lifestyle advice, mm. and you can start the treatment way beyond they even come come to see you. Mm. And a lot of these techniques and these ideas are enough that the person can call you at the top of a mountain with mm. no access to anything other than their own body. Mm. And you can teach them how you can tell them how to fast, you can tell them how to sleep, you can tell them how to do some basic forms of hydrotherapeutic, you know, measures to reduce or improve the circulation or increase the temperature or lower the temperature ever so slightly just to produce some form of comfort if is required mm. but that is also gauged on the person's understanding mm. so for example myself and jasmine my wife you know we were at university together 23 years ago we haven't used any form of medical intervention over that entire time or at least since one year after leaving university so that's no no painkillers no intervention, no medicines of any version. That's Jasmine having two children at home. That's mm. both of our children never seeing the inside of it. And that's me managing, you know, crazy stuff like knocking myself unconscious at a skate park <laughs> and like trying to get myself out of Gloucester Hospital before mm. they admit me, mm. you know, because you, you, you have ways of through drainage or movement or circulation mm. or hydrotherapy hydrotherapy or meditation or breath work mm. or anything to control what you're feeling mm. 
Um, but these are all feelings. So once we understand the symptoms, we can manage it. If mm. you understand the feelings that might come from, I'm not a female and I haven't given birth to a baby. I've, I've, I've witnessed two births <laughs> and I've witnessed a lot of people who have free birthed their baby or birthed them without medication. Mm. Well, you know, from the external, you could go into that room just before the baby was about to being born. And if you'd never seen anything before, you'd think that there was something horrendously, terribly wrong going on with the <laughs> female. And if you had a big needle in your hand that said you could just take all of that pain away, mm. well, with the amount of screaming or noise or, or movement or energy or emotion that was being shown, you might think, well, why, why, would, I, why would I not offer this to the person? Mm. But of course, you, you offer that to a you know, free birthing natural mum. They might, you know, they might throw it straight back in your face yeah, and tell yeah. you where to go mm. because you might be saying, well, you're making a lot of noise. It sounds mm. like you're distressed. And they, well, they'll say, well, have you tried pushing a baby out of your, you know, and see whether you're <laughs> going to make any noise? And then, of course, we, we, we realize that the only person who can understand what the person's feeling in the symptomatology is themselves, mm. is the patient. Anything mm. external of that, we're already layering our own judgment, mm. you know, and if you have 10 osteopaths, all of our understanding as to our past, our experiences, what we felt ourselves, what our partners, mm. our children have felt, what we've done for our children, what we feel mm. guilty about, you know, that mm. all comes into conference. So mm. some people will say it's totally fine to medicate your children. Well, why not just give them cowpol and antihistamines and puritons? Why not do it? It just makes your life easier. It makes them sleep better. It makes mm. the kids like not moan. It makes them be quiet. Well, yeah, that's the case. But, you know, we also understand that their bodies are, understanding how to build an immune system will do them all the good later mm. on mm. and stop the 30, 20 years worth of us mm. trying to unwind them from a chronic state yeah. of disease yeah. to yeah. a state of acute stage mm. that we've got to teach them in their 50s that having a that having a fever is going to be okay this time mm. around and of course we're three years down from the covid pandemic and everybody's mm. only just about able to have a cold nowadays yeah. Yeah. because they realize it's not going to cost them two two weeks worth of self-isolation mm. And a lot of judgment from their friends. And so mm. actually, whether you've been vaccinated or unvaccinated mm. or COVID or not COVID, mm. it doesn't matter anymore because everybody mm. realizes that everybody can get it and everybody can hold it. And everybody mm. can pass it on. Mm. But we're back to the stage one, which is still nobody really understands or is told via mm. the mainstream as to how to manage an acute crisis. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, and it's exactly. the most fundamentally important thing that you can possibly do. Mm. And if you're going to, <laughs> so I'm getting excited. <laughs> but if, you're, if you're going to, to unwind a patient from a chronic state of disease to a state of what you might consider to be much more healthy practice, mm. it would be crazy. In fact, it would be stupid to think that you could do that without there being some form of acute eliminative or mm. inflammatory effort by the body. Mm. It would be great if it could, but it's just not the physiological no. rule and it's mm. not what happens in the body. Mm. And so therefore we have to be prepared that that's exactly what our body's mm. going to do. And so if mm. we teach them that, that's much, much easier. And I find it extremely exciting, especially mm. when people are like, you know, first, second, third stage cancer. They've gone through some form of alternative or they've gone through some medical treatment or maybe they've gone through some non-medical treatment. Mm. And you get them to their first kind of crisis that might take them two or three years. Mm. But like to see somebody phone you up and be really excited that they've got a cold, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> really yeah. excited. Yeah. And that mm. is just a, that is a whole thing, you know, and, mm. and the same thing with children. You, what happens after an acute crisis with kids is that the parents feel ruined and the mm. child feels wonderful. Mm. If you do it, manage it right. Mm. Then the child doesn't sleep very well. They burn a fever for maybe two days and they're coughing and they're spluttering and they're coming into the bed and they're waking you up and they're all like, uh, uh, and they're grouchy and they, their tummy hurts and then they, they're not hungry, but they ate something before and it's still sitting in their system and you just have got two or three days worth of all of this acute fever buzzing mm. of energy with inside of them but of course you're exhausted because you're trying to hold together your job and you're, you're mm. not sleeping at night time and you've got the kid two kids sleeping in between you and your partner or on your own if you're unlucky and you're managing single sing, single parenting mm. and of course then after two days of running a fever the child goes like 
Woo! I feel brilliant. I'm really mm. hungry now, mummy. I'm hungry and they become a gannet, but they've also mm. upgraded their system. They've mm. like learned a lot. They've like, they physiologically start walking or talking. Mm. They start riding a bike or they, you know, they, they just, their tooth comes through mm. or their skin starts eliminating or their new hair starts mm. growing or their nails start or the, all these kind of things start happening. The child feels amazing. The parent feels horrific because <laughs> they're exhausted. Yeah. But swap that round the other way, and mm. normally we're just used to medicating the children with cow mm. and everything just to make them sleep because I've got to go mm. to work the following day. Mm. And, you know, I don't want the kids being awake because I'll just be tired all the time. Mm. And then quite often the kids just never really get that, you know, they don't get a proper acute crisis. So then it mm. comes back two weeks later or a month or two months later. And then it goes in this cycle or they, they get that mm. cold, but they never really get much better. And then rather than that, their guts start playing up. And we we started mm. the cycle of never having a good, fast, proper, mm. well-managed acute crisis. Mm which as I said in those analogies before, is like taking all of that rubbish out in your garden mm. and one day when there's no wind and it's a nice sunny day and none of your neighbours are around, you decide to burn that bonfire. Mm. And you set light to it and what do you want with a bonfire? You want it to be well controlled, but you want it to burn fast because if mm. it burns fast, you get less smoke. Mm. So what you don't want to do right when you're bonfire is burning is for your neighbour to come over and chuck two buckets of water over it and mm. a sort of like, you know, wet rag because mm. then it's just smoldering and it's smoky mm. and then the smoke's going everywhere and then you're mm. coughing and you can't see what's happening and you're not sure whether you should pour some petrol back on the bonfire because mm. then it might blow up the petrol and you mm. oh you just got to wait till it all starts again it's very mm. unsatisfying yeah. yeah whereas you want that thing to burn fast yeah. and then you, as an osteopath if you've done the lifestyle things and if the patient has taken on those then the acute crisis is so much easier to manage. You're mm. just there to just monitor it. You don't need to do anything gung ho. Mm. I would say, Alex, sorry, I was coming to my head that we're talking about kids, but also when, when you have adults that they come with, uh, normally they have more acute uh, musculoskeletal pains because they have been, you know, neglecting all the other yep. symptoms. When and, and and you know you you have uh, we have doctors that they recommend not to take any painkillers or uh, anti-inflammatories and if you see those patients that they have this acute onset and they go to hospital yep. and they put injections cortisone anti-inflammatories yep. they come out of that acute episode much worse than someone who just took rest, uh, relax, inhibiting those adre adrenals, had some treatment and they come out much stronger you can see that or feel that in the in the tissues as well i mean it's, it's also you know within yeah. that musculoskeletal aspect yeah. as well. definitely yeah yeah i 100 percent agree but mm. then it's back to the whole thing of suffering you know most of medical intervention uh, at least on the acute uh, not on the acute like trauma side but the management of the chronic or the acute constitutional is the suppression of the inflama inflammatory organs that are in, that are eliminating mm. so, you know so you know your skin and your lungs and then the, your kidneys all of these areas inside of your body that are, are eliminating waste then they get itis stuck on the end of it or the you know asthma and eczema and bronchitis and laryngitis and you know asthma all of these kind of external factors that are simply signs aren't they that the body is tiring and the and the patient's feeling tired the patient's feeling run down they're just at their they're at their wits end on so many fronts and what is very difficult for people to understand is that it would you know it is more pleasurable to take two or three days off work <laughs> guilt free try and spar yourself into a better state of health when you're not in pain Mm, yeah. Or you wait until your body just prostrates you and sticks you in bed for three days, feeling absolutely mm. raging in pain because you just you will you were not listening to any of the signs. Mm. And I find it amazing how, like in our thirties or forties, I think we're stuck at desks, the majority of mm. of professions, and we become ninjas of sitting. We're so strong at sitting, but we can't do anything else. We can't stand up any longer. Mm. We've lost the flexibility to stand up in a straight mechanical line we're sort of slightly chair shaped 
You know, our knees are forward, our glutes are backwards, our chin is forwards, our diaphragm's tight, our chest is collapsed, our guts are falling out, the inguinal lip, everything's just chair shaped. Hmm. And we've got to, and sometimes the body just, it's just had enough, hasn't it? It's just, then we go and pick something up and with the tiredness and with all those, these other constitutional things. So getting people to understand that acute and just paying respect to that is really important. Hmm. And I will always say to people, look, there's no, again, there's no judgment for me. If you want to take some painkillers or if you want to go and get some easy, quick fix at the beginning, that's fine. That's your choice to make. You, everybody has their own pain boundaries Mm. i'm able to deal with when i have a bad acute you know musculoskeletal injury in my body i know what i know what i've done i know what i've pushed to it and i realize oh this this is comeuppance for some of my stupidity Mm -hmm. and then i realize recognize where what i've lost in my body or i haven't been walking i haven't been stretching Mm -hmm. i haven't been moving i've done too much lifting and too much driving i've been stuck into too many patients blah 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 but it just is a respect you've just got to understand okay that's Mm -hmm. my body throwing out a sign The, the problem is is that most people just don't link any of these signs or have never had any linking of the signs to to their body mm-hmm. it's all just oh i'm really sorry that you've got that or i don't really understand why you've got it or you must be unlucky that you've got it here's I, some medication that will mm-hmm. that will suppress it and yeah. of course if you are in raging pain whether it's sci- proper sciatic pain or you have a you know you you have some form of disc prolapse or you've kind of got some compression or you've torn some ligaments or something like that then of course there, there there is you know there's always morphine at the end of the day there's always some form of like you know drug you up to the eyeballs you won't feel anything you'll be floating mm-hmm. in the clouds but up until that point there's all versions of symptomatic relief but if that just allows you to go back to the chair or back to the wrong diet or back mm-hmm. to the thing that you were doing in before then obviously you're going to be in a worse state mm-hmm. than you were if your, mm-hmm. your body is physically collapsed then you know what we what we put our bodies through we would never do to a car or a building or if you did you'd never drive that car and go in the building yeah. we have these terrible you know fossils of a mm. of these bodies coming in which have very little very little understanding or relationship mm. one bit to another and yet we're driving around in them all day long mm. and they're kind of maintenance free aren't they you know uh, for for a, a lot of people, well, they think they are maintenance free. They never yeah. have to do anything with them. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's so, everyone uh, eating it, badly. Yeah, it's like it's like at the badly. moment, isn't it? Like, and I, I, I like to think at the moment, you know, t- t- telling everybody about their little seasonal cough and cold that's happening at the moment as the seasons mm. change, as it gets a lot darker, it is a lot darker. It's gone a little bit colder, but it's but it's actually been very warm here in the UK mm. and that's yeah. where you go. Yeah, but this, you know, November and people still walking around in shorts and t-shirts yeah. occasionally is just about to plummet. Mm. But the body can notice that change, and your mm. skin constri- constricts mm. a little bit. And we're wearing more mm. clothes, so we're not sweating. Mm. And so, when we're not sweating, that third kidney, i.e., our skin, mm. isn't working anymore. Mm. And so, the kidneys have to take over. And I liken this to just kind of in the winter time, you go and you get into your old Rolls Royce in the garage that hasn't been driven for half a year, mm. and you start the engine up. And Bang, boom, all this kind of black smoke comes flying out the back of this old engine as it literally clears the pipes. Mm, mm. And so at the moment, everybody's reliance on the elimination going through their skin in this wonderful, lovely hot summer that we've just had mm. is now closing down. But the skin needs, still is eliminating. It's still producing urea. It's still mm, producing mm. some of these toxic compounds. It's still giving off heat. But suddenly, as it goes cold and the central heating kicks in, the um, the superficial circulation dies away and our skin becomes a bit drier and maybe a bit itchier. And then so then we rely more on our kidneys and our lungs. Mm. But then, of course, we've got central heating going on. So the central heating dries the air. Quite often we're really stressed. So most people are mouth breathers rather than mm. nose breathers, which dries the back of their throat. And so, hey, wait, wait, hey, behold, as the skin closed down, the lungs kick off and we have a cough and we have a cold and an irritable throat at the moment that everyone here in Stroud, everyone's got coughs and colds and they are snotty noses mm. and the kids all that. Because it's this time of year where well, our bodies are changing. We're going from sunny and open and summery to dark and cold and wintry and our body makes that physiological change now if we can just see it 
then you just have to put up with those days and put up with the fever and invite the fever into your home as far as your kids are concerned mm. because it's stopping that that then throws said water on the bonfire outside. Mm. It's better to have three days of being acute and doing what the Chinese say, which is never stop snot on the brain. You know, allow your body to produce this toxic load and eliminate it through all of mm. the orifices in your body come mm. out the other side a cleaner version of mm. the person that you were before mm. um, and you know going back to this original concept today of vitality we're just thinking about people who are in a chronic state of disease mm. where they don't have the vital energy to raise an acute eliminative effort mm. and you're there to say okay i have to really respect my r mechanical and physiological principles that we have mm. to understand that sometimes we could just yeah we could lay them on a table and we could give them four hours of treatment <laughs> but we can't make them lose 10 stone and we mm. can't change their diet and we can't mm. take away the six months of deep adrenal cortisone stress that they might have mm. placed on themselves we can't do that mm. Um, and so sometimes we have to back off and recognize when the patient's coming in with a list of drugs down their arm and, and a list of genie things that we spoke about at the beginning of what mm. they want to achieve, that we just have to think, okay, well, actually, this person really needs a little bit of nurturing. Mm. And that probably I need to go a little bit more down that natural hygienic route mm. of giving them more information mm. and doing slightly less, because although they really want their, mon their, their money's worth of time mm. on, I have to explain to them that, you know, me giving them a really long treatment might feel really nice today, but they might just not be able to cope with it the following mm. day. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I, I leave that in with, with, with myself that I, mm. I had my own little treatment crisis at the end of summer because, you know, my, my mum was moving home. We, 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 uh, so she sold the family house, mm. went through about three months worth of going through my parents and my entire history because it was the house where I was born. It was a little bit like I was clearing out a house from my mum that she died, but she was still alive. Uh -huh. um, but the process was exhausting it was adrenal I was backwards and forwards with work uh -huh. and I knew that there was about three weeks to go and, and a friend came over and she gave me a treatment with some acupuncture and my body just gripped hold of this treatment and just was like yes this is it I'm going to do everything uh -huh. and I was not ready for it I I uh -huh. I, 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 I just it just set off this cataclysmic kind of treatment reaction where my body just decided, right, that's it. I'm Humpty Dumpty. I'm going to break and I'm going to fall apart. I'm going to have a nice acute crisis in bed. But my body couldn't physically do that mm. because I still had to move my mum out. and I still yeah. had to do all these other things. Mm. So then you go through this patch of really seeing where somebody else has tried to help you mm. and they've undone all these keys in your, in your mm. body. But actually you really weren't ready for it. Mm. You know, I, I needed to do a load of work really before mm. I had that treatment mm. to get the most out of it. Mm. And the more reactive and the more responsive you are to treatment, and my body's very responsive mm. to treatment, it's responsive to myself, but especially to other people. But the more reactive it is, the more it will grab hold of mm. that power from the outside mm. and it will use it. Mm. But if you if you if they haven't had any preparation, it can be really difficult to manage. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is just a learning, that is a mm. learning tool that we mm. you know, you go it's about a within yourself. Practitionership, within your isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. And sometimes as well, if you know, if 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 you do overdo it and you put people into that, you know, kind of force people into that kind of reaction when they're not ready, you don't get another bite of the cherry. It's, uh, you it's, don't, unless, you don't unless they're prepared for it. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and, and as I said, and, and then if you can prepare for it, but then that sort of stops it. And I, mm. I'm amazed by the amount of osteopathic chat that will happen on some really rubbish Facebook groups yeah. about like, you know, oh, I don't really understand. I, you know, treat this patient. They're in loads more pain or I, I don't know what to do. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know what people are being taught out there nowadays, mm. but it seems very abstract and very removed from some of these real necessities. I, I really think that the management of the acute and talking about this is your gateway because it, it gives mm. you this idea as to how to, gently oscillate and articulate mm. and integrate mm. the patient back towards mechanical mm. principles it gives you a way to sort of delve into 
alkalinity and sunlight mm. and all of these things that their bodies require we've spoken about before on these sort of physiological principles mm. but then you're guiding them towards the acute acute, acute crisis mm. but you're trying to make it as pleasant for them as possible mm. yeah. and exactly as you said diego at the beginning if or you said robert if your dog's not coming down if the, the dog knows what to do you know when they mm. when they've injured themselves they the cat just disappears don't they mm. they go find a bush they crawl mm. into it they mm. sleep, they don't eat, and they burn mm. a fever. And mm. they either come out of the bush or they don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah, yeah. I think I think, you know, a lot of the undergraduate stuff is has become much more disease centric rather than, you know, uh, looking for health. It's disease centric, uh um screening for disease. And so so often when you have these these Facebook things as you as you just said, you're and someone said, I don't know what's happening. Has anyone else got any idea? And you'll get people hunting in more and more obscure pathologies that it might be you know yeah uh, and normally it's, it's based isn't it it's based on actually what the worst case scenario is yeah. have you made yeah. sure it's not this you know yeah. because we we are we are still in a fear-based culture mm. um mm. and there, there are many times within the management of let's say children childhood illnesses where mm. they've got temperatures and coughs and this and certain rashes that come out mm. it's very hard to say exactly what's happening yeah. to them but yeah. the one thing is for sure, the body knows what it's doing and it's doing yeah. something right. Yeah. And as long as we as long as they're not in a sort of dangerous position, mm. there are always ways that we can mm. um, guide, not suppress, mm. but support yeah. those conditions. Support the process. Support the process. Yeah. Yeah. And but like and, and as you said at the beginning, Diego, like actually, you know, wh when people are acute in acute physical pain, but also acute um uh, constitutional healing mm. it's not the time to be wading in with a really long treatment mm. and it's not the time to be talking to the lots they need mm. quiet mm. they and you know they 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 need as as a lot of the nature cure and osteopathic books will talk about they need to get the rest of the family out of mm. the room mm. um they 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 need to have doubt removed from them they they just want to sleep Mm. And it's everybody else who just wants them. Oh, if only they could eat and they could feel a bit better. If if only yeah. they could, yeah. you know, they might as well say, if only the person who's in there could make me feel better about myself, about yeah. them, it would make yeah. me feel much happier. Yeah. Like if they were yeah. in there and they were okay, if they weren't, mm. if they weren't in, if they weren't suffering so badly, I would be better out here. Mm. You know, mm. can't they just suffer quiet? Mm. <laughs> can't can't you suffer quietly? <laughs> But, but it is it, it is true you know yeah. you, we, we, we we like quietness calmness um you know a, a, a acute you know that's actually where i'm I, I don't know the answers but you know even i've had these some conversations with the classical osteopaths deep within good physiological reflexes which is let's say you've got a child with a fever and the child comes in with a fever and you think, OK, I'm going to do some very gentle occipital inhibition because that will relieve some of the deep and the superficial circulation. And I'm going to inhibit through D1 to D4 because then that gives the superficial circulation. And, and But I would say, like, well, why are you doing that in the first place? What What's wrong with the child having a fever? Hmm. Like, do we actually need to do anything about it? Like the the child, mm. the body inside of that child has decided to have a fever. Now, well, whether that's because some... of a bacterial infection or it's yeah. because of the, it's eaten some food that it shouldn't have, or it's the presence of something or it needs some form of inflammation, but it's come in, whether it's chicken mm. pox or mm. measles or mumps or, or a tooth coming through or bad guts or like a, a healing. It doesn't really matter. Mm. The body's come in with a fever. Yeah. So who are we to even think, yeah. okay, well, the fever, the fever, the pamphlet on the fever section mm. says, you know, press on these buttons. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. and there's a lot of pressing on those buttons that can reduce the fever, but is that any good to the patient? Well, it's, it's, sometimes it's to support the process, but to ameliorate suffering. Ah, but who's the suffering in, Robert? Well, sometimes it's pain for the child, you know, like a headache. True, true. Mm. But sometimes it's the pain for the adult who's dealing with the oh, child yeah, who's yeah. in the pain. Yeah, and that's because, the fear. Because, then. because my children have been in extreme amounts of pain, mm. 
but they have no reference point to the fact that I can do something to take the pain away or I can give them something to take the pain away. Yeah. So yeah. whether that's a horse ripping out Skylar's toenail or Zena oh. being bit yeah. straight through the hand by a great bane dog yeah. Yeah. or falling on their face and half breaking their zygomatic. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They don't have any. There's no like, just give me the pills or the cow pole or take mm. me to the doctor. Mm. You know, the best they've got is, can you give me a cold flannel? Yeah. Or can yeah. you get daddy? Yes. Can you, yeah. can, you know, they want mummy all the time, but when the kids are injured, it's where's daddy, you know? Yeah, yeah. When, when, when I say ameliorate suffering while yeah. supporting the process, I don't mean give them cowpaw. I mean, no. yeah, maybe, yeah, you know, a little bit of a, a suboccipital inhibition to so that so they can comfortably sleep and go through that fever process exactly mm. but then the fun but then the funny thing is is again the hard the hard difficulty with me is it's still hard to know when you've suppressed it that helps them and when yeah. you've suppressed it when you don't yeah it's yeah. like at a, at a at a moment of transition of a, mm. of a female about to give birth to a baby it will be the most heightened won't it you know <laughs> and you know the, the midwife will look at you and when the, and the person says i can't do this anymore that's yeah. it i don't i just don't think i've got enough i yeah, don't yeah. can't get I, I can't do this anymore mm. and the mid yeah. midwife kind of goes it's just happening right now yeah, right yeah. now like, it's happening it's transition. this is it yeah. okay and so within that, that's at the point that we go, can we, oh, can I just, can I do something to alleviate their pain? Can I, can I, what do I press on to make this better for them? Mm. But it's coming to a volcanic eruption where the body is doing something physiologically. Mm. And so within fevers, the body was trying to put a fever. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just being mm. really dogmatic in the sense mm. of these are all the questions that have always gone mm. through my head. Mm. When to do it, when not to do it, yeah, when when, yeah. when shall we do it? You know, yeah. let alone cure, never touch a patient. Don't go go in there as osteopaths and yeah, chiropractors yeah. do. Let yeah. the rule, let the physiological rule, yeah. let natural yeah. law. Natural law yeah. and gravity is a lot more construct in what yeah. it wants to do. It doesn't yeah. mess around with all yeah. of our like things of what suffering is or what yeah. isn't and those kind of things. Yeah. And I and I've only learned that as a so to think like in our last mm. podcast by seeing the kids and seeing them at this age where mm. their real understanding is different because they mm. just their understanding or what they interpret pain mm. because there's never because me and Jasmine or I, we, there's no fear about the pain mm. there's we don't we don't show any fear about mm. the pain we show them just total understanding mm. and that we're mm. sorry that they're they're mm. suffering but the, the mm. suffering will do them the good. Mm. Mm. And so they have gone through that so many mm. times that they just know they will feel horrible, mm. but they will wake up and they will feel better. Mm. Um, and even Zena or even Skylar was in, oh, yeah, isn't that, didn't Skylar's hair all like fall out and she had measles afterwards? It mm. got really thin, didn't it? And then that huge lion's mane hair came out of it, like all yeah. of these developmental yeah, things yeah, that yeah, they yeah. remember as kids yeah, yeah. that were sometimes the biggest times where they were the the most ill mm. was the time when they got the most healthier or the, the most yeah, the biggest yeah, changes yeah. happened afterwards yeah, their yeah. nails their hair their vibrancy yeah. their immune yeah. system their ability to deal with that yeah. outside yeah. was the best after they had lost all of the weight and had two weeks of being yeah. really really ill for example yeah, yeah. i do and, i do agree with that and it's no it's knowing when to yeah when to do something and that is a really difficult thing and and you do have to ask yourself who are you doing it for are you doing it for yes. you yes or are you doing it for them yes absolutely and it's very difficult within the process i'm very lucky me and jasmine went to school we went to university together we've gone yeah. through all of this together yeah, yeah, yeah. i know just i know a lot of osteopaths or people who have got these ideas but they're with mainstream other halves it's a very different yeah. very, very <laughs> different scenario yeah you know um it's 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 nice for us to be able to mm. you know I'll, I'll you know i'll we we support each other as mm. as far as parents are concerned mm. um but i think that probably in the teaching mechanism what we're trying to do here isn't it is we're, we're sharing mm. these kind of stories as mm. to these are a multi-faceted multi-directional mm. information that's coming into us mm. palpatory mm. visually mm. olfactorily mm. like we are <laughs> emotionally we become so we become mm. so in contact mm. with the patient mm. The, the, you know lines are blurred as mm. to like as to like how much we really mm. understand a patient i i, well, I we, got laughed, we, i got laughed at the other day yeah. because 
I, I was running the men's group that I have here on a Friday, the outdoor lifestyle and men's group. And I came out afterwards and I said, oh, guys, someone, someone left their jumper here the other day. Whose jumper is this? And the six or seven guys that were there, they said, oh, no, that's not that's not us. And I said, oh, oh, that's weird. And before I knew it, I'd picked up the clothes and I'd given them a good smell. <laughs> and I went, what the hell are you doing? I think I know who this is. I don't know. <laughs> I, I won't recognize them. Yeah. Yeah. I know the smell of this person. Yeah. I know this microbiome. Yeah. Yeah. You become so like, you know, yeah. you, you become so entrenched in people's, mm. you know, stuff. Yeah. Um well you, you are start, you are the, the main you you are the main part of their environment at, at that yeah. in that, that point. You are their environment. Yeah. Yeah, you're you you the you're the person pushing them on the swing. Yeah. yeah. You're the person rocking them on yeah, up, yeah. up and down on the seesaw. Mm. You know, you're becoming you're becoming the external monitorer mm. for their vibratory level. Mm. So as mm. Diego was saying, like, you know, mm. they need to be shaken up a little bit. Yeah. And it, <laughs> all these terms of yeah. holding onto something and mm. you're rocking them mm. and it's not rocking, I'm gonna hold it. Mm. I'm gonna I wanna hit, I'm gonna tap it. You know, yeah. sometimes you scratch a patient, yeah. scratch it. Rock and mm. oh, hit the patient. You know, give it a, uh, a, tummy, mm. uh, you know, a rock and a pull and a pull. <laughs> and then maybe go back to quiet, quiet yeah. again. Like, yeah. how am I going to wake this organism up? Yeah. Or how am I going to dissipate force? How am I going to allow nervous, or uh, you know, blood? How am I going to help heat to dissipate? You know, these are all these are all techniques, but monitoring of the patient looking at them how they are on your plinth how they move how they breathe all of the things that they tell you and how they then respond to you under touch is is mm. i think just all the big clear indicators mm. um, and then you've got to like see those patients who are much more on the acute the chronic side that are probably going to take quite a long time to push towards in the acute mm. Where you've got other people who are coming in through the door and they mm. are just on the acute phase mm. already. Mm. And all of these techniques that we have to to change physiology is mm. just is the is the is the wonder, really. It is, it is. And and it it's it's such a it is a, a wonderful thing to have and be involved in. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So I was thinking, uh, as you were talking, you know, this quote from Steele saying that to find health should be the, the aim of the doctor and anyone can find disease. And every aspect that you, you mentioned, even this funny thing about smelling, smelling, you know, we, we need to find health. And if mm. someone smells bad, is, I mean, uh, there is a disease, there is something going on. There is mm. not something yep. wrong in the body or the patient doesn't sleep or how they move on the table. We, we're trying to find health. And, uh, of course, we we are not doctors. We, we don't have to name diseases, but we know something is wrong in, in the body. And we are trying to uh, push up the, the immune system, to move things around, work with the nervous system. But even doctors nowadays, you know, the, the cancer therapy, they, they are trying to push uh, new cells, to develop and and you know to fight against these cancer cells so they are trying to find health within those cells so we are trying to find health with the tools that we have which is you know treatment um healthy living naturopathy so i think i think everything you were saying is it was coming to my head to, yep. to say this but it, it is clear to my head yeah, and I think you know the. I think that there was another quote. I can't. I don't know who it was from, either Little John or someone else. But the, the whole physiological thing of it was some something along the lines of that the greatest physician can like you know help treat a patient when they don't even when they're not even in the presence of them. You know, you can you can give them advice from afar, um, and I think that that's important because that also empowers the patient. You know, it's not mm. that they have to just have their osteopath or they have to mm. have that i mean we're we're, we're, we're teaching them we're, te we're yeah. teaching them some yeah. of the rules that we're picking up of their body mm. and sometimes mm. you know we're there to understand that you know maybe having asthma for example might actually seem easier to somebody mm. uh, much nicer than having eczema now mm. on, on, the, on the biological mechanism the body would prefer to eliminate toxic mm. waste through the skin than it would mm. through the lungs mm. But you know the the skin comes with all of its social 
mm. and kind of external showings mm. to our mm. friends. And, you know, we don't mm. like being covered in spots mm. or extras or dry, dry psoriasis or those kind of things. Mm. Whereas we can have perfectly shiny looking skin on the outside and have those, you know, psoriatic um, patches on our lungs and we mm. could have really bad really bad um asthma but we wouldn't mm. see it from the outside mm. um th then we've got this problem of how do we help the person express itself and what do we understand it it, it mm. reminds me of of a, of a of a of a very old classical osteopath that said that um they were treating someone with rheumatoid arthritis and all of the hands were all gnarly up mm. and these you know really fused joints and the person had come in and so they were giving them you know the the body adjustment and they were working with them physically but they were also kind of doing basic hydrotherapy and changing their diet and their lifestyle and stuff like this mm -hmm. and their skin and their and their and their and their um uh, their, their joints and everything started to move a little bit easier mm -hmm. but their skin started sweating and they stank mm -hmm. <laughs> and the pay I, I i can still be, remember being a student and the person saying so I told I told the patient that they'd gone 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 from having a life threatening condition to being socially unacceptable. I know I know <laughs> exactly well, who you're talking about. You know then. who I'm talking about, <laughs> and it was brilliant because it was a, such a good response. It was yeah. saying you know, like their joints can work and their body's not necessarily um, attacking itself. Mm. Mm. But they absolutely stink because their sweat <laughs> glands are kicking off, and they're mm. and they're breathing out some of these toxins. Yeah, and yeah. That, that made such a big impact on me all yeah. those years ago. Because mm. you're going, okay, fine. There are these different avenues: mm. the skin, mm. the lungs, the guts, the kidneys, mm. and there is this overriding constitutional thing of fever mm. and lethargy and loss of appetite. And on top of that, we've got this sort of mechanical approach, and mm. mechanically wise, and through the viscerosomato and somato visceral mm. reflexes. Mm. We have mm. such an amazing ability to kind of go straight into the matrix, into mm. the mainframe of another patient mm. because of this ability to touch their skin mm. and to breathe with them and to move with mm. them and, to, and to, with treatment to become mm. part of their body. Mm. And so all of these t textures and emotions and things that they can feel and we can feel within them mm. are all part of changing and listening mm. to their body. And the mm. organism responds to that. Mm. But we would be silly if we thought that we could just take people who are in chronic states and not allow yeah. some of that pressure to come out. Like you've yeah. got a very fizzy water bottle and yeah. you've got to take the top off. It's yeah. just how quickly could you undo the top <laughs> without froth going yeah. in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the other things that that person said was if it, if it looks like poo and smells like poo, it probably is poo. <laughs> Talking about stuff that you're eliminating, you know, which is uh, bodily yeah. waste, bodily Absolutely. waste, you know. So, yeah, you have to just be quite, quite, quite normal yeah. with the smells and the, the smells mm. and the feelings mm. and the vibrations that come off patients. Mm. But I would say again, you know, back to the one, we look after ourselves as best as we can. Yeah. Yeah. We're in a better position to not be affected by that. So yeah. people who have very toxic patients, don't yeah. be surprised if you feel toxic afterwards. Yeah. If you have yeah. somebody who's in acute physical pain, re re yeah. remind yourself that the vibration within that organism is m really high. Yeah. You know, and so they are vibrating with en energy mm. within their system. They're hot. They're mm. <laughs> and. It, that's like a bus coming up mm. pulling up next to your car and it's got certain type of vibration and then your car mm. starts to shake as well which yeah. is why if you take someone who's really acutely ill and you mm. stick them in a room with 10 people mm. you might get three people you might get nine people mm. who will get acute and maybe mm. those people have been in a closed off room they've been mm. next door they haven't been in any physical contact mm. so it's not like the germs jump down their throat or something no, no. their body is responding to the vibration mm. and we mm. can feel that can't we we know mm. when our friends come in and they're upset we know when your mm. kids or your parents are angry or upset or let down you could put terms and emotions and words to mm. people's postures mm. and all of that is all emanating through vibration mm. not only through physicality but through mm. toxicity mm. and so it's important that we have our own mm. vibration as osteopaths and mm. we try and ground ourselves as best as we can whether that's mm. 
you know, barefoot treating and eating carefully and mm. going about going outside and getting in nature and touching a tree between patients or washing mm. your hands and, and emotionally thinking to try and get rid of the energy of that person. And then trying to come into contact with your own breath to kind of put mm. your own defenses up because there are a lot of sick and ill and acute people out there mm. and that can be really that can really run us down you know you mm. can pile energy into a patient mm. feel absolutely deflated and give them loads of energy um and just just almost res respectful of the amount that the interaction mm. will will affect you as a mm. as a practitioner as well mm. so coming out of it and how many people have treated bad necks and then two hours later in the afternoon feel like they have the same neck that the patient <laughs> has you know because you're yeah. because you become yeah. posturally and mm. fascially and viscerally and energetically part mm. of that patient. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Alex, it's is wonderful listening to you and, and, and you you speak a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, honestly, it's it's great. Listen, shall we? I, I, yeah. I, I we've been talking for almost two hours and uh, we were supposed know. to do forty minutes. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm very sorry to stop you here, but uh, just to so people will hook to the next episode. Next yeah. one, would you be happy to talk about the 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 after that chronic stage and, and that change in life when people realize that of course I have to do something in my life and, and change different habits. And I know you are very much into um, exercise, therapeutic exercise, uh, healthy exercise movement, um, baths, um, you know, all these changes that that we yeah. have to do. Shall yeah. we do that on the next? Um, I'd love podcast? to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd love, I'd love to do that. Yeah, just take, 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 take yourselves further. And I just say, you know, if people listen to this and they, you know, some of it highlights them or they've got questions or they'd like us to talk about different avenues just to, um, you know, they've hopefully got your numbers, but hopefully maybe there's a comments bar or they can yeah. kind of mm. ask questions about things that they'd like to talk about. No um, they can always, yeah. you know, I, I've had some good responses um, just on WhatsApp and text messages from mm. osteopaths and from patients around the world and here who have picked up, you know, some of these podcasts and then kind of really just said, look, these are the things that have really made a difference to them. And mm. I've got colleagues as well who have listened to that and really thought, oh, these are the things that I've taken from this new one. Mm. And, you know, there's questions because, it's, it's, you know, all of this is all a work in progress, isn't it? Mm. We've got so many doors to open. So mm. if anybody has a little, little snippets of stuff that we've spoken about today they'd like to carry on with and as i said i'd like to be able to do some maybe open lectures with people in the f mm. future or we kind of do some movement classes where we kind of mm. get everybody actually moving very slightly mm. I, mean, I don't like really necessarily the word exercise i just prefer mm. movement mm. you know and i move a lot during treatment so i i cover you know if i'm doing a five hours worth of osteopathic treatment i'm probably you know covering a good four of those five hours on my knees or mm. moving around i'm very little time I'm actually sitting down mm. which then allows me to just I'm covering four hours worth of yoga mm. whilst I'm treating other patients mm. and mm. that makes me responsive to the treatment that I'm giving it gives me more information and tactility but it also improves my physical ability and I'm not just sat at a chair so you know as we go further forwards what I'd like to do is to be able to encourage these healthy lifestyle changes and things that improve us as osteopaths mm. and then only improve our energy for ourselves and our mm. interaction with the patients and then mm. and then it goes full cycle and then we're back into this whole like healthcare thing so mm. yeah let's, let's 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 look at all the positive things next week or ne mm. next time mm. and uh yeah. anyone who's got any questions get hold of one of us and say oi talk about this yeah or just be quiet and stop yeah. talking <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, giving us the time again, Alex. It's always it's always wonderful, really stimulating and interesting listening to you. Thank Brilliant. you. My pleasure. Mm. Love, love you to speak to you guys. I'll speak to you mm. soon. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye.